I'm Tim Meyer, located at Stanford in the Palo Alto VA. My topic is improving solid clearances by hemodialysis. I'm obliged to begin by telling you that I've served as a consultant for the Baxter Corporation and that I get research funding from the National Institutes of Health and Stanford University. That done, I move on to urea, which is where we begin any talk on solid clearances by dialysis. It's our prototypic uremic solid. That is a chemical that's normally removed from the body by the kidneys and therefore builds up in the body when the kidneys fail. Why is it our prototype? It's the most abundant compound in the human urine. It was actually the first organic chemical to be synthesized in 1828. It's derived from dietary protein, and there is a slightly better reason to use it than its simple abundance as an index of replacement renal function. That is that before dialysis was available, doctors noticed that lowering dietary protein relieved the symptoms of advanced kidney disease. However, as early as 1944, when Wilhelm Kolff, shown in a picture with an early dialysis patient, he started dialysis, he realized that urea is at the utmost only partly co-responsible for the clinical symptoms of uremia. But nevertheless, we choose it as a measure of the results of dialysis. He did that, in fact, because it was the only thing he could measure in the two-doctor rural hospital in which he did the first dialysis during World War II. The problem is that we've stuck with it over the next now close on 80 years. Why is that a problem? Well, we did go on in 1985 from using the blood urea concentration, the BUN, to using KT over V urea as a measure of dialysis adequacy. That is, if a patient comes in with a BUN of 100, we lower it by about 70% on each of three weekly dialysis treatments. But if the next patient comes in with a 50, we don't say, oh, you're much better off. We lower the 50 to 15. So we're not using urea itself or its the urea concentration as a marker of toxicity but we're using urea as a marker for the other solids which we presume cause illness. And in using KT over V urea, that is in using this index of urea removal as a measure of adequacy, we acknowledge that urea, as Culp knew, isn't itself responsible for many symptoms. But we assume some other things which we in fact know to be untrue. We assume that the dialytic clearance of toxic uremic solutes is the same as the clearance of urea. That is, if we make the blood flow higher or the dialysate flow higher or the dialyzer larger, we assume that it will affect the other solutes the same way it affects urea. That is undoubtedly not true. We also assume that the volume of distribution in the body the space in which other chemicals, which are uremic toxins, are dispersed is the same as the volume of distribution of urea. Again, almost certainly not true. Finally, we assume that the toxic uremic solutes are produced proportional to body water volume. This is an assumption which was only a, a matter of mathematical convenience to Gotch and Sargent when they developed KT over V urea. It's not biologically reasonable. How has this affected the way we do dialysis? Well, it's made us look good. Urea has unique properties which make it easily removed by dialysis. Here you see a common dialysis prescription, somebody thrice weekly hemodialysis. The time is 180 minutes, about three hours. Blood flow, 360 milliliters per minute. The dialysate flow, a little over less than twice the blood flow, 600 mils per minute. This would give a standard patient, standard size, a single pool of KT over V about 1.5. It makes us look good because the urea concentration in this maintenance hemodialysis patient is only four or five times normal. But again, that's because urea has unique properties 
which make it easily removed by dialysis. Think of the blood, that's the pink, flowing through the dialyzer with solutes in it. That might be urea, the little green dots. The dialysate is flowing in the opposite direction. And the solid has to fuse into the dialysate. Urea is removed uniquely among uremic solutes, not only from the plasma in the blood compartment, but actually removed from the red cells. There's a urea transporter on the red cells. So the urea is removed almost from the entire water volume, both in the plasma and in the red cells as the blood flows through the dialyzer. Now there are other uremic solids that are inside the red cells, for instance, creatinine, guanidine here. Guanidine's concentration in the red cell is actually higher than it is in the plasma. So if we could make the guanidine come out as the red cell went through the dialyzer, we'd get more guanidine out of the blood. But guanidine doesn't come out of the red cell as the blood flows through the dialyzer. Urea has a second property which is also important in making us and our dialysis treatment look good. Urea is very small, a molecular weight of only 60 Daltons. Here again is the picture of the urea concentration through the week. Rising, the first dialysis on Monday, dropping about 70%. Rising again Wednesday morning, falling during my three-hour dialysis treatment, rising until Friday, falling back, and then the long split until dialysis comes again Monday. What would happen if we thought a toxic solid were bigger than urea? Well, it would be removed less well. In fact, what we call dialysis, dialysis machines, should be called urea removal and urea removal machines. By accepting urea as the marker of dialysis adequacy, we've limited our design of both dialyzers and dialysis machines. Our design is in fact very good for what we have said we want to do, which is remove a large fraction of urea <clears throat> during an individual dialysis treatment. But it doesn't do so well for bigger molecules. This is urea at 60 Daltons. The blue line is a hypothetical solute that's four times larger than urea, a molecular weight of 240 Daltons. The green line is a solute that's four times bigger still, a molecular weight of 960 Daltons. Plasma solutes with greater molecular mass diffuse more slowly. And it's diffusion that we rely on to have the solute move from the plasma into the dialysate flowing in the alternate direction. So the same dialysis prescription that removes 70% of the urea uh, removes less than half of the larger solid. Here again, suppose the solid has a mass of 960 Daltons. We're not removing as large a fraction as we are of urea. We could do better if we simply increase the size of the kidney, we'd lower the levels of this hypothetical solid a lot. Again, it's the same number of days of the week, three, the same time on dialysis, three hours, the same blood flow, the same flow of dialysate in the opposite direction. The difference between the red line and the blue line is that the red line was made using a dialyzer, which we have designed to remove urea. And it's plenty big enough to remove most of the urea but it's not big enough to remove most of these larger hypothetical solutes with a mass of 960 Daltons, that is 16 times bigger than urea. Do solutes like this exist? Yes, they were the original middle molecules. Old nephrologists like myself will think of middle molecules as having a molecular weight of 500 to 2000, which was their original definition. And they were steady in the 1970s. But when we adopted KT urea as the index of adequacy in the mid 80s, we largely gave up an experimental search for larger molecules with molecular weight of 500, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000, which might contribute to uremic toxicity. 
What we did go on with was looking for still larger solids. When we say middle molecules nowadays, we mostly mean things like beta-2 microglobulin, a low molecular weight protein with a mass of about 12 and a half thousand Daltons, or somewhat larger still, the kappa light chain here with a mass of about 22 and a half thousand Daltons, and many, many more. The number of these things, bits, fragments of degenerated proteins, proteins shed from cell surfaces, parts of receptors is probably very large. What about removing them? Well, most of this audience will know that the introduction of so-called high flux dialyzers in the 1980s facilitated the removal of these low molecular weight proteins. The diagram here shows on the y-axis the sieving coefficient. That's the fraction of a solid that will move through a membrane as water is pushed through the membrane, going all the way from nothing going through to one, meaning the solid goes through in proportion to its concentration. And here we see that the so-called low flux membranes used originally in dialysis, by the time you got up to the molecular weight of beta-2 microglobulin, which you remember is 12 and a half thousand, almost none of the solid was going through. And then with a high flux membrane, you got a significant portion. This audience will also remember, however, the results of the HEMO study published just 20 years ago this year, which was in the figure on the lower right, comparing the outcome, the number of patients surviving after most of five years of follow-up being not improved at all by the use of the high flux membrane. This, as people my age will remember, was really a big disappointment. I think a lot of us expected that more dialysis, the other arm of the hemostedy was an increased KT over B, and better removal of the big molecules would produce better health. It didn't work. In the case of the big molecules, why not? Well, here was a surprise. These are the plasma beta-2 microglobulin levels in the hemostatic. First, look at the dialytic clearance. It did increase from a minuscule three mils per minute with the low flux dialyzer to a value almost 10 times as large with the high flux dialyzer. But now look what happened to the plasma levels. The plasma level of 42 milligrams per liter with low flux dialysis only went down by about 20%. Well, now how could we increase the clearance by tenfold without getting a bigger fall in the plasma level? Many people will know that the answer is partly that there's a steady continuous clearance of beta-2 microglobulin outside the kidney and outside dialysis. So in normal people, hopefully you and me, the clearance of beta-2 microglobulin is largely accomplished by the kidney where the clearance is a large fraction of the glomerular filtration rate. But somewhere else in the body, and we don't really know precisely where, these low molecular weight proteins are chewed up at a rate which is significant, not when compared to the GFR in normal people, but when compared to dialysis treatment in patients with end-stage renal failure. So while the dialytic clearance went way up, going from low flux to high flux dialysis, the total clearance didn't rise all that much. There's another problem, which was uh, <clears throat> came up later when we're going to consider trying to double down on increasing the clearance of low molecular weight proteins. Many people know that when hemo failed, one idea was to say, well, the low molecular weight proteins aren't really a big problem. But another approach was to say, well, gee, as I just showed you, we didn't really reduce their levels very much. And we could reduce their levels more if we removed solutes by ultrafiltration, by pushing solid containing fluid through the membrane with fluid replacement, a technique that was developed in 1967 by the late Lee Henderson. He again was using it to try to remove the original middle molecules solids with weight 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. And he said that a diafiltration device would have the advantage of more rapid removal of these 
then to him large poorly diffused toxins. But the principle of diafiltration could be applied to the low molecular weight proteins if you have a membrane that has enough sieving capacity so that when you shove salt water through the membrane, when you ultrafilter the plasma, you'll get rid of molecules, not only beta 2, with 12 and a half thousand, but even 30 or 40,000. Is this going to work? Right now, we don't know. There's no clinical study that yet establishes the efficacy of better removal of the low molecular weight proteins. People will know that there are three trials of hemodiafiltration, uh, two negative, one slightly positive, and I believe further work ongoing. But there's also a theoretical problem that I think raises some doubt as to how well we can do by increasing the clearance of the new middle molecules, the low molecular weight proteins, the things with a molecular weight of 10, 20, and 30,000 by intermittent treatment. The problem was first revealed by Dick Ward back in 2006. Remember that one of the troubles with our adoption of urea was assuming that other uremic solutes are distributed and move about in the body the same way of urea, and that this isn't true particularly for the low molecular weight proteins. Here you see the body displayed as a blue box. You see a low molecular weight protein. I'm using a number which is about right for beta-2 microglobulin being produced at 200 milligrams per day. You see that solute being dumped into the plasma volume of three liters and being distributed between the plasma volume of three liters and an interstitial volume of about 10 liters. You see what I told you about was a slow, continuous non-renal clearance, which keeps the level from climbing very, very high, even in aneuric patients who were dialyzed with low flux membranes. You see us supplying renal replacement therapy intermittently several times, usually three times a week. But you see a new element. You see a problem with this large solute getting back and forth between the plasma and the interstitium, mainly getting from the interstitium to the plasma, when we try using a new high clearance during renal replacement therapy to remove the solid. This is the modeling done by Ward, and it compares um, high flux hemodialysis, these dashed lines, hemodiafiltration, this dotted line, with a clearance of 75 mils per minute. You remember that's a step up from the high flux clearance of 25 or 30 that was seen in hemo. And then a hypothetical clearance, which he could not in fact achieve experimentally, but just imagine being able to achieve with a device that would achieve a clearance of 150 mils per minute. You see each of these clearances being applied three times a week, standard down, up, down, up, down, up, of thrice weekly renal replacement therapy. And you see the disappointment, the prediction by mathematical modeling of a disappointing reduction of what is now a six fold increase of clearance, reducing the level, depending on whether you measure the peaks or the averages, by only about half. The problem again is some non renal clearance, but perhaps an even bigger problem of this difficulty of us cleaning the plasma while the molecule holds up in the interstitium and doesn't quickly move out. On the right side, further mathematical modeling of this problem. This is a prediction of what would happen to beta-2 levels relative to low-flux dialysis treatment. Again, the treatment in the hemo-low-flux arm a clearance on the x-axis of only about three mils per minute Let's say that you and I could just gradually make better and better machines, better membranes, ultrafiltration, absorption, any techniques, and run the clearance of beta-2 microglobulin, again, our prototypic uh, low molecular weight protein, up from 3 to 100 mils per minute, a 30-fold increase in clearance. What would it buy us? We predict something like only a 20 to 30% reduction in the plasma levels with four-hour weekly 
three times weekly treatments or the dashed line with slightly increase in the treatment length. This is a problem which remains to be overcome. And again, we hope for more clinical studies, we hope for improved devices, but right now we don't have the evidence to know that improving these molecules will, uh, removal will improve our patient's health in part because we simply haven't got the level of means to get the levels down a great deal. I'm gonna now move to the second class of uremic solids, which behave very differently from urea. And again, I'm emphasizing classes whose behavior is very distinct from urea, the low molecular weight proteins now called middle molecules, and here the protein bound solids. But protein binding and size and other characteristics across, occur across a, an enormous range. The number of uremic solids now known is well over 400, and we're, again, stuck with urea picked by Kolf in 1944 because he had nothing else that he could measure to check on the performance of his machine. Why aren't the protein-bound solids removed well? Well, it's not because they're big. They're small. They stick, though, to protein. These red dots are red blood cells. They're supposed to be albumin molecules. And what happens is only the free portion of the bound solid is able to move. Only the free portion drives diffusion to the dialysate. When one protein bound solid molecule diffuses, another one falls off and can diffuse. But with current dialysis membranes, current dialysate flows, the clearance is very limited. The clearance can be increased by increasing the size of the membrane, that's this dashed line, and by increasing the dialysate flow. Imagine if you put the Mississippi River in the dialysate compartment, the concentration would always be zero. So you'd maximize the low concentration gradient provided by the free solid level in the blood. And imagine if you made the membrane huge, then this low diffusive gradient would still remove all of the protein bound solid. And we can in fact increase the clearance of a typical protein bound solid by increasing the membrane size and the dialysate flow. As shown on this next slide, this is an experiment of my colleague, Dr. Sirich at Stanford. These were patients on thrice weekly nocturnal dialysis who were sitting on dialysis for eight hours and they were therefore dialyzed with a low blood flow. Because the blood flow was low, they were dialyzed with small dialyzers and a low dialysate flow of 300 mils per minute. Their urea clearance, 211 mils per minute, was thus a large fraction of their blood flow. There was no reason to use a larger dialyzer and a larger dialysate flow with a low blood flow. But when Dr. Sirich and I did put these patients on dialysis with a larger dialyzer and a dialysate flow that was, what, two and two-thirds times as big, the urea clearance only increased a little bit. That again is because the doctors prescribing for these patients had given them a dialyzer size and a dialysate flow that was appropriate to the goal of achieving an adequate KT over V urea three times a week. But look what happened to the protein bound solute, one of the most common ones, it's almost as, serves almost as much as a prototype for protein bound solids as beta-2 does for large molecules, as urea does for small non-bound solids, the solid in doxyl sulfate, which is about 95% bound to albumin in an ordinary dialysis patient. The clearance, again, is a small fraction of the urea clearance because it sticks to albumin. But if you increase the dialysate flow and the dialyzer size, you can just about double it. Does this do the patient any good? We don't know yet because we haven't done any large study to try to find out. As is not the case with the large solids, there hasn't been a commercial effort to build a device that will remove protein bound solids better and try it on the large scale. We don't have the diafiltration studies and we don't have new membranes being advertised to better remove protein bound solids. There are other ways to clearance, uh, increase the clearance of these solids. One is to infuse a displacing agent. 
if we could find something safe that would bind to albumin and push the bound solids off. Another thing that's being tried is to alter the plasma chemical environment, change the pH perhaps. Or most recently, there's been discussion of applying electromagnetic fields to somehow remove the bound solids from the alveolar. I'm going to show you one other potential method which could be tried on at least reasonable scale clinically. That's to put a recirculation circuit into standard dialysis. Here we see the plasma in the blood. This was an experimental benchtop dialysis setup going first through a recirculation circuit before it flows through a conventional dialyzer. Conventional dialysis again on the right, the plasma flows straight through the dialyzer, moving through the hollow fibers. The dialysate is on the outside, moving in the opposite direction and carries away solids like urea. But what's been done here is to run the plasma through two dialyzers in a row. That was done just simply to get a large membrane area and to run dialysate on the outside of the fibers again, a conventional setup, but to simply recirculate the dialysate through activated carbon, the stuff that used to be in cigarette filters, which takes up a large number of uremic solids. What happens if we do this? Well, remember that I told you that we could increase the clearance of bound solids if we used a high dialysate flow in a large dialyzer. But to do that in the clinic would require a great deal of dialysate and a lot of new plumbing. This setup, at least on the bench top, does work. You're seeing the results of, a, of an experiment in which a jug of bovine albumin, that's cow albumin, with solids dispersed in it, served as a patient and sat next to this setup with the recirculation circuit first turned off and then turned on. The urea clearance didn't change. Activated carbon doesn't take up urea. And so even if with recirculation, the urea clearance stayed the same high fraction of the, of the plasma flow, which was here 240 moles per minute. But the clearance of endoxyl sulfate, again, starting out about 10th the urea clearance, was increased here more than threefold. And we could go further if we want to. That brings me to my conclusion. First, to admit the limitations of this talk, I've concentrated only on three times weekly hemodialysis and diafiltration. But many of the same considerations apply to peritoneal dialysis and to dialysis performed at home or more than three times a week. In order to improve our treatment, we have to know what we're trying to remove because different adjustments in the prescription affect different uremic solids differently. The main problem has been that there's been very little clinical testing of means to improve solid removal. With the exception of the European trials of hemodiafiltration, since hemo, and that's 20 years, our business, the business supply that providing renal replacement therapy dialysis, hasn't seen much in the way of experimentation. And what we need to find out whether better removal of large solids is good for patients, better removal of protein bound solids is good for patients, or outside the scope of this talk, trying to reduce the production of some solids is good for patients. What we need is clinical experiments. And hopefully the next 20 years we'll see more than we've seen in the 20 years since he. Uh, thank you for your attention.